everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good Thanks morning. for spending your morning with me. Um, when you think about sales, does it make your heart kind of race and your clothes get kind of tight and you just maybe <laughs> don't feel like the best version of yourself? More like the middle school version at lunch, trying to find a spot on the first day. Mm -hmm. um, it has a way of making us feel weird or act weird when we're not weird people. And I'll explain why and show you an approach that makes it easy, no matter how bad you think you are at sales. And I know you don't believe me. Just wait. Um, so have anyone here had sales training? Oh, not that many people. That's good. Um, did they tell you to do something weird that felt weird? No? Wow, that's very unusual. Usually they tell you to do something that feels weird, especially the financial planner. I'm shocked about that. Um, <laughs> they almost <laughs> always uh, complain about that in the sales training. Um, they tell you to do something that feels weird and that you have to do it a hundred times before it feels normal. And so get ready to be rejected a whole lot before you can ever be good at sales, which sounds terrible, first of all. Um, and then it leaves people saying, like, why, why hasn't it worked for me? You know, like, am I bad at sales? I keep trying and it's not working. And it's because your sales is not a one size fits all. So when you get a sales strategy from someone else, it was designed for a different person with a different personality than you, with different services and a different audience. So why would a financial planner and a marketing uh, agency have the same sales strategy? It makes no sense. It's kind of like, if your friend came to meet up with you and had a beautiful outfit on, would you assume that the outfit would look great on you? No, they have a different body type, different coloring, different style than you. And it's the same with sales. There's nothing in life that's one size fits all. So I really like giving people the permission to not do things that feel weird because that's usually not the case. Although luckily for everyone in this room, that hasn't been your experience, but if you have an experience, tell them, no, I'm not going to do something that feels weird. Because if you feel weird, the person across from you definitely feels weird. Okay, what about this? Have you ever had an experience that was like awkward with an aggressive salesperson? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we're all naturally born able to sell, actually. So if you think about, have you ever try to get somebody to go to a baseball game with you. And one of, let's say there's two different friends, one's married and one's not. The way you would pitch it to them would be different, right? So the married one, you would be talking about, oh, it's going to be great weather. You're going to get time to just be on your own, your alone time. <laughs> if it's somebody who's single, there's going to be people to mingle with. I'll buy you a beer. We're all naturally born knowing how to do this. But our past experience makes us so scared of being that person that we go 180 in the other direction and undersell and are usually not doing justice at all to our service. We're so scared of being pushy and like making me feel uncomfortable and weird. And the reason you had that uncomfortable experience with a salesperson was because they had bad sales training. Um, most sales training is about trying to trick people into buying with you. It's strange because you don't need to do that. <laughs> There's no reason to trick them at all. Um, so it's important to think about how this is not a sales conversation. Think of it more like dating. So you want to find somebody who's a fit for you. You're not just trying to marry anyone with a pulse, are you? <laughs> no. Like, do they want kids too? Do they have the same financial habits as you? These kinds of things are important. And it's the same when you're talking to somebody about working with them. Um, you need more criteria than a working credit card for clients. So there are things that, that make somebody a better fit for you. And you want to design your sales strategy around that. So I'm Alicia Farr, and I have created the Matchmaker Sales Method. I've got a lot of experience in sales and helping a lot of other people. So what does this mean? It means that I've helped seasoned salespeople increase their close rates from 50 to 80%. And I've also helped so solopreneurs starting from scratch make their first sales. So what we're going to cover today are the limiting beliefs and myths, the, the matchmaker sales method, and how to apply it to all the different phases of your call so that you never feel awkward or gross 
depending on, it doesn't matter where you are in the structure of your sales conversation. Okay, so first of all, what does a good salesperson look like? This is a really common uh, misconception that they look like this. That they always know what to say. They're really smooth, they're charming, um, extroverted, having a lot of rapport. But the thing is, everybody expects a salesperson to be like that. So they kind of don't trust them as much when they are like that. And there's nothing wrong with being this person. There's something wrong with pretending to be someone you're not. So if you feel pressure to be like high energy, there are sales trainings that tell you to jump up and down and listen to your favorite music before a call and be extremely high energy in the sales conversation. And if that's not you naturally, there's no reason to do that. So I really like to give them the permission to just, if you're awkward, you can say, hey, I, I feel weird about sales, but I want to find out if I can help you. You can actually say that in conversation and it builds trust because all anybody really wants in a salesperson is someone who cares about understanding their situation and if they can help them. That's, that's really it. So everyone in this room cares about the person they're helping, right? You want to find out if you can do something for them and you're not going to sell them something that's not going to work for them. So you can just be yourself. And everybody will like that so much more than the person who's perfect and saying all the right things and, you know, talking about the whatever game. Um, you can tell that I watch a lot of sports. <laughs> um, so the matchmaker sales method, um, old, an old fashioned concept for matchmaker, right? They take two strangers and they get them married for life. So I realized that it's kind of similar to a sales conversation because it's a business and an ideal prospect and they don't know each other, but from one conversation, they end up exchanging, you know, hundreds of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the strategy that a matchmaker uses to get two strangers married for life is very similar to what you can use in a sales conversation to convert 80% of the people you're talking to. It's basically like, does this person check these boxes? Because when it's a fit, it's a fact, and there's no selling involved. It's just, you're the person that we get great results for. You have everything in place that we need, and this is what you can expect. And I don't see any red flags. You know, like you have a significant amount of debt or you have um, pre-existing medical conditions or whatever. So it makes it very easy to transition into the sale in an empowered way because you've checked all the boxes. And you can say you're not this person. You are this person. So it's a fit. And there's no weird transition period, which everyone, you know, a lot of people don't know how to navigate that part where they ask for the business. Very easy to just ask for the business because it's a fit. So this applies to every part of the sales conversation, which I kind of mentioned before. And I mean, even around investment and budget. So for example, a marketing agency talking to someone, they're like, okay, you want five posts a week on three different platforms. You want hundred subscribers by the end of the month and you can invest this much for it. Yeah, that's what I get results for. Or if somebody says they're not sure what their budget is, has anybody heard that? <laughs> So you give somebody an idea of it. You say, well, usually for what you're asking for, for five posts on three different platforms, it would be $1,500 a month. Is that investment realistic for you? And they say, no, well, it's not a fit. But you can also say, well, what if we just started on one social platform and we could continue from there and that would be more like this. And all of a sudden you're working collaboratively to see if your solution makes sense for what you know they need to get results instead of you telling or selling them. So um, when you focus on the fit, you never get lost in the conversation. So a lot of times I'll talk to people who are like, they threw me a curveball. They asked a weird question. There was distractions. You know, there's all kinds of sales. That's why it's impossible to have a sales script because people are unpredictable. So to have the same exact thing that you're saying every time is just not realistic. So um, if you, no matter what happens, focus on, but is this a fit? Just come back to that. It's very easy to never feel like you don't know what to say or you feel like gross or salesy. So um, how do you focus on fit before a call, right? So some people, a lot of people, well, have you ever heard, the more sales calls you have, the more you'll sell them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a really common belief. 
However, if you're meeting with anyone with a pulse or a credit card, it will take time on your calendar. Um, <laughs> you're not going to be excited for those calls because you don't know if they're a good use of your time. You're showing up like, is this person going waste my time? I have no idea. I'm not excited. There's a million other things I could be doing. And sales is a mental and emotional game like nothing else. The way you show up in the fall makes a huge difference to somebody moving forward with you. So when you show up like, I don't know if I even should have this phone call or this meeting, the other person feels that. So what if you knew that somebody was sick? Would you show up excited for the call and quality and ready to like have a conversation about whether you can help someone? Definitely. So there's a lot you can do before the call that will make a big difference. So some people are like, what do you mean? If anybody books a meeting with you online, you can have a form that they fill out beforehand that answers some questions that let you know if they're a fit for you. If you feel weird about people filling out, filling out forms, which happens. There is a strategy to it. You don't want it to be like a spammy, gross, long form answer form. But if it's set up correctly and somebody doesn't want to take five minutes to fill out a form, that is a red flag that that person is not a good client. So I would just let go, if you can, of it being a barrier to somebody booking with you because we don't want anyone who doesn't have five minutes to, to fill something out. It's not a great buy. So um, I'm going to show you some questions from a client before we did. Uh, my intensive diagnostic process. So the thing she was asking before she had the call, she focuses on med spots who have injectables and lasers. So she was asking their social handles. Why, why would you need that? Um, also wanted like this very detailed rundown of all the things that she offered in her services and what her goals, what their goals are, which is really a conversation more for the sales conversation. It's not really something to know if somebody's fit beforehand. And this one, you could just ask, oh, you need to have, they need to have injectables and lasers. Let's just ask, ask do you have injectables and lasers? The yes or no question. So afterwards, that's what we did. And you can even kind of sell it a little bit, right? Like this is who we work magic for. This is our ideal client. Get them excited to fill out the rest of the, the questions. And this is just a small sample. Um, you know, she needs to know if it's med spot owner. And then also, do they have a team or is it just you? Because she helps both. So she knows the team ahead of time. She knows how to structure the conversation, what to talk about, as opposed to just someone on their own. So that helps a lot beforehand to know how to structure the conversation. But then there's the, the question. So a lot of people are asking the same question. It sounds like nobody here has gotten bad sales training, so that's great. But you might not be, you might be missing some opportunities for questions that are going to position you as an expert in what you do. So um, have you heard of the sales strategy where it's like about uncovering someone's pain or fear and just really scaring them if they don't move forward with you? They call it the cost of inaction. So if you don't do this, your life is, I mean, you're going to be homeless, you're going to be divorced, kids aren't going to love you. And so if you don't pick me, like, have a nice life. Um, so that, while it could be kind of effective, um, there are lots of issues with how somebody comes in when they've been sold that way. They don't show up the same, first of all. But also, whether they know, most people are familiar with the strategy, so there's high buyer resistance. And even if they're not familiar with it, they don't get the feeling that you're an expert. The questions you are asking aren't about them and your service. They're about how horrible your life is and how horrible it's going to be. So whether they know what you're doing or not, they're definitely not being sold, basically. So what are questions that can naturally sell you without even trying? Okay, so I'm gonna do this again with this before. Is this helpful to before? Like the before? Okay. So this is a med spa client again. And um, she helps people, because med spas have these a la carte Botox services and stuff, and you're selling like $300 services at a time. So she helps them create packages that are comprehensive, that are six months, look 20 year younger packages kind of thing. Right, so these were the questions she was asking before. If we were having a conversation six months from now, what would we need to happen to be happy? This is just about samples. What's the biggest problem you're dealing with and what kind of impact has this had on your business? Uh, at a glance, they seem okay. They're fine, you know? But they're not specific to her. So after our process, 
Are you attracting clients who can afford your services or a pricing objection something you deal with a lot? She knows that that's a pain point that she solves and something that her clients are dealing with. So they're impressed by her expertise just by her asking, and they feel like she understands them. If you had to say, what percentage of clients are repeat clients right now? Which is a big issue. They're always trying to, they're on this new acquisition hamster wheel instead of just focusing on their current clients. So they're able to have that conversation and the person feels understood and like she has an, a solution for, for them. And then have you ever considered or tried creating signature office offer packages for your business? And the reason this is important is if they have, you don't want to get to the end of the conversation and be like, yeah, but I tried this before and it didn't work. You want to have this conversation at the beginning. So what did you do when you tried it? You're usually able to identify why it didn't work before. And you can have that conversation proactively and say, this is the difference with what we do. A lot of times in her case, they don't have any sales training. So they created a package, but nobody knows how to sell it. So it's not selling. So she's able to say, well, we have sales training that's going to show you how to sell it in a way that doesn't feel weird or gross. Um, so you're set up to kind of naturally sell yourself in these, and actually you're kind of just sold by the questions alone because they're so specific to the person you're talking to, as opposed to the ones before, which were just really generic and like any business could be asking, basically. Um, so I have one other example. Um, so I think this will be fun, actually. Let me show you the question and tell me if you can tell what she sells. Who knows? <laughs> You're clearly trying to, to find out that I want to make more money, but that's about it. Um, so she helps online business managers get out of um, hourly rates and get into a consulting role so they can charge more and work less hours. So after our diagnostic process, we put together some of these questions. So how often do you feel like you're doing a lot of tasks that you don't enjoy or someone with lesser qualifications could do? This is specific to their pain and specific to what your solution solves. They can say all the time and drive me nuts. Great, you don't need to do those things anymore because you're going to position yourself as a consultant. How often do you experience scope things with your clients? This is also super specific and something that they're all struggling with. And she can explain how her solution solves that. And then how often are you advising your clients on how to improve what they're doing but don't get paid for it? Well, let's get you paid for it. So you're, it, it's so different when the questions are this specific, the person sold just by the acne of them, but also you're able to have this conversational exchange with somebody that builds to more trust than just like a rapid fire Q and A interrogation. It's like a conversation. Like, and if the person answers these questions correctly, they're a fit for her. That's exactly who she helps. Okay, so objections. You know that feeling with objections where you're almost like, oh God, I have to defend it and explain the value of what I do because they don't see what I do. And so you're kind of defending and, and some sales strategies even recommend that you attack the other person and, you know, make them feel really stupid for considering other options or whatever. Um, so how do you feel when a salesperson does that to you? Just like kind of dismisses your objection completely and just is like, well, no, actually that's completely invalid objection because, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, it doesn't make you feel like you want to buy from them, right? So how can you handle it differently? You want to treat it like maybe that's valid. So like, oh, you're worried about the sunshine coming in a certain way with this blind, for example. Um, well, what, which way does the, the window face? You know, you're able to like ask some more questions instead of being like, it doesn't matter. All the sun is blocked from these amazing uh, lines because they have these materials in them and like a highly tested process and whatever. You know, like instead you're just like, oh great, that side, no problem. Like, or maybe this one would be better because it's thicker for you. So you're you're facing the west side and that makes sense. Or you know what I mean? Like you're able to have this collaborative conversation about it when you treat it like maybe this is a isn't a fit. Like that's okay. And letting them know if it's not. Like, yeah, this is blind. These blinds are not a fit for you then. Let's go look over here. <laughs> like, no, no problem. Um, so I'll give you some examples here. 
Somebody says, this seems complicated. Has anyone ever heard that one? Yes. Yeah. So maybe the, you would say like, well, we have these videos that break it down really easily and someone guides you every step of the way. So it's really, it's really not complicated. Does that mm -hmm. make you feel like you want to, like, do you believe that person when they say that? You're like, of course you're saying that, yep. you know? Um, so instead, what seems complicated? Which part? I can tell you that 95% of the time, the person just doesn't have clarity on what you're saying or what you do. And as soon as you talk about it, they're like, oh, okay, I misunderstood. Got it, shouldn't be an issue. So they're just slightly confused. So, and then you're like, well, does, does this make a difference for you? Does this make it less complicated for you? You wanna ask them, like, if you have somebody guiding you step by step to ask questions whenever you need it, does that make a difference for you? knowing that they'll get back to you in whatever amount of time. So another one, this seems really complicated. Has anyone heard that one? Well, considering that you get this much money for it, it's really a small time investment. I mean, it's definitely worth it. But it does not make you feel, you're like, ah, kind of makes me feel bad. But not necessarily like I want to move forward. Um, so instead, how much time do you have? What are we looking at here? Do you have other commitments? Like what's going on? So understanding what that time looks like. So you can have the conversation about whether it is an issue. What's your schedule like? What commitments do you have going on? And you know, maybe it's valid and they don't have enough time. And that's something you should definitely talk about and say, yeah, this is not for you. You need something else. But usually it's not a problem. They're just confused about how much time it takes or they haven't thought about their schedule completely. And they were just thinking that they were overwhelmed in their head because we all feel overwhelmed. Busy all the time or whatever. Um, yeah, you have other <laughs> and then the last one, this seems like has anyone heard that one? <laughs> um, so the options are usually a really long tangent of everything included because you feel like you have to defend the value of it. So you're like, what did I say? This and 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 this. And the other person's just kind of like zoned out, honestly. Um, or from that cost of an action strategy, well, you want $2 billion. So, you know, is that worth it? Or would you rather just be homeless and divorced? <laughs> divorced with the no kids or whatever. <laughs> is the other alternative. You would actually be safe to do that. That's me, right? <laughs> um, right. <laughs> so instead, you can say, expensive compared to what? Because you have no idea what their frame of reference is. And a lot of times it's not apples to apples. It's a lot of times it's apples to oranges. So when you talk that through, you're able to say, well, does that other solution, do they have this thing that you need? Do they have the lifetime warranty on the blinds? Does that make a difference for you? Um, that if anything happens, they're fixed or whatever. And really have this like collaborative conversation where you're able to understand together. And people are much more convinced by that. Can you see how, would you feel more comfortable with that versus like somebody just dismissing it? Okay, so you guys can understand together. Okay, so you want to ask yourself, who do you get results for? What do they have in place? Do they have like a certain amount of assets? Do they have a certain amount of debt? Do they have a certain number of clients? Do they have certain many years of experience? Um, and then you want to ask yourself, who do you not get results for? Who is the red flag? Like when they have this, it's just not a fit, or it's harder, or it's something I don't enjoy. Those are all allowed. You can you don't have to work with anybody or do any projects that you don't like. What is the thing that you love doing? That problem you love solving, you love the transformation. It's like when they have all this in place, it's like boom, boom, boom. Perfect. And then reverse engineer your sales strategy around that. <laughs> From what you asked before the call, to the questions in the call, to how you explain what it is that you do for them. Base it all around these are the people that we get results for. It's just a fact. You're not convincing anyone. So what if they still don't need to work? Has anybody here heard that the fortune can follow up? But like, what does that even mean? It, it's just a catchphrase, right? Um, but what if you understood it so well that you knew exactly what to do that converted people? You need something comprehensive that's not, hey, I'm just checking in, surfing back, following up, touching base. 
When somebody sends you that email, do you want to answer in the following up checking in and session days? Usually not, because it's basically like, hey, are you going to buy my thing? It's very one sided. So, anyway, I have these follow up email templates that are not that. If you want to go and download them, there's five of them for different scenarios and situations that you can um, use that are proven to get response. You'll get a response whether it's a yes or a no. Um, let everybody do that. And then, um, if anybody has any questions about their specific business or like scenarios or anything we've talked about, yeah. Could you tell us a story about one of your situations where you're able to use your techniques and how that worked out for you? Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, I apply it to every part of the call. So I actually just had um, a conversation with these guys who I found that it is harder for me to get results for somebody who has really been indoctrinated with that like cost of inaction training. So I did a sales audit and I looked at his script and it was one of the worst scripts I've ever seen. Um, there was a part of the script where they asked the other person like, does that sound exciting to you? Come on, I wanna hear it louder. But a one-on-one -on -one sales time to it. I was like, oh God. Um, and I was like, honestly, I'm so sorry, but like, if you've been doing this for so long, so long, and there's so much repetition, it's just something that you default on. So I'm not the best fit, but I have some resources that I can send you that will really help. So I was able to, it was the opt were you asking for one that wasn't it? Either way, that was a story. Most, that was the most recent one. And <laughs> I, it, I want to help so badly, but I also don't want to take your money if it's going to take longer for you to get the results. So, um, and when you communicate that it's not a fit, people appreciate that usually and will refer you to the future and build trust. Because I know that that's like a scary thing for a lot of people to be like, it's not a fit. But it's actually the most liberating thing to not take on people who are not fit. Um, there's like a, a belief that some money is better than no money. I would say that it's something, right? Um, but that some money client who's asking for a lot of extra things or needs a lot of extra help or whatever, is going to take away all of your time and energy from the clients who are perfect for you. So it ends up costing you way more money in the end. I don't know if anybody's had that experience. Like you took a client that you knew wasn't a fit, you did it anyway, and then you were like, I will never do it again. And then you did it like three more times. <laughs> and then you were like, never again. <laughs> and how did you get to that space? Like, did you just have experience to build the confidence? to know what your business provides so that you can communicate that more effectively with someone who's not a fit? Yeah, some of it is some trial and error. Like I've been doing this long enough that I know that I'm not the perfect one for you. Like there's somebody who's gonna help you way more. Um, but some of it is also like, when you've had that experience, you just don't wanna have it again. <laughs> and you can tell someone that before they get started. I think it's one of those things that you really have to experience firsthand. Because when you're looking at money in front of you, even though it sounds like a lot of work and it's not a fit, you just want the money. Unless you've had the experience. It's hard, it, it's hard to say, learn that lesson just from hearing it from somebody else's. So yeah, I've definitely <laughs> stepped in that hole a bunch of times. I was a marketing, I had my own marketing agency before I did sales coaching for the last three years. So that's a place where it often happens because marketing has so many moving parts and clients like to be like, <laughs> and you're like, oh God, you don't have anything in place and you're expecting a lot. And it applies to every industry though. <laughs> like those nightmare clients, um, landscaping for sure would apply to that. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, why is it so expensive? And it's like, well, you asked for like the most custom of work, you know? Like, so that's where it, the question, the curiosity really come in place. Like, what about this, having this is important to you? Maybe there's another way we can have that same effect for you that's not that price. But if this is what's important about that for you, like you need it to be the most sustainable materials from, you know, Bali, then it's not going to work. You know? And what are your thoughts? Can I ask a question? Uh, thank you for this. It's been great. You know, I think there's two different types of sales strategies. There's like a soft approach and then there's that like hard sales, like, you know, 
And when a customer says or a client says this is too expensive, is it okay to affirm them? Like, you're right, this is expensive. Instead of maybe saying like expensive compared to what, is it okay to affirm them? Like, you're right, this is expensive. But the ROI on what you're gonna get is way more than the cost that you're gonna put in. Obviously, if you have a beautiful business on the outside, it's gonna draw more people in increasing your sales. So is it okay to affirm them in the objection? What what makes you like what is the intention behind the firm? Like letting them know that like if if they're doing a landscaping project, yes, it is expensive. Like your business is really expensive. Yes, you're right, it's absolutely expensive, but so is you know just letting them know like yeah i agree with you i hear you yeah and this is the reason why it is expensive or think about the roi and let's crunch that out to see what the difference is actually going to make or maybe showing some studies of the different like whatever xyz that they're getting is going to make for them and their company yeah you can do that it will just be more powerful if you do that through asking them instead of telling them so it's like expensive compared to what well i've never looked into landscaping before well, yes, landscaping is more expensive than people expect all the time. Um, you know, have you looked at other companies where actually like in line here? What was your budget? What were you thinking? Do you have money set aside to get the ROI that you're looking for? What kind of difference do you think this would make in more clients coming in? Um, so like getting them to the same thing that you're saying, but through them getting there themselves will help a lot more. So like do you think this will make a difference in your business? How much? How many more clients? Have you heard people say they don't like what it looks like now? Maybe you don't ask that. Maybe you haven't. Yes. But you know what I mean? Like kind of guiding them to that answer. Because hopefully it's true, but if it's not, and they're like, it doesn't make a difference. People will come in if I had a chain link fence. You're like, okay, well, probably doesn't make sense for you then. Does that feel? Thank you. Okay. So that's kind of a follow up question in regards to cost. So the objections, you had the objections up there. Is there, because that's always kind of the, uh, for, that's on the forefront of people's minds is what it's going to cost and is the value associated with it. So how do you incorporate that more in the front end of the presentation or just in the conversation so you kind of take that objection away? Yeah, so I do have something um, I call pitch meetings, uh, which is, sounds a lot like what you're talking about, where you really like weave it in more in the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, right. So when you ask a question that gives you an answer, like one of the most, the, the opportunity that you always have to do this is, have you ever worked with financial institutions? And what was that experience like? And they're able to tell you what they liked and didn't like about it. And you can say, this is a common experience with financial planners. The difference of our approach is blah, 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 blah. And we find that that creates this result instead. Mm -hmm. Does that make a difference for you? You want to ask the question at the end instead of just saying the thing and then continuing on. If you can remember to say, like, does that resonate with you? Does that make a difference for you? Is that important to you? Then you're able to really overcome a lot of that up front. So you want to like tie in the things that what, what people commonly experience with financial planners is this and that. Has that been your experience? This is how we provide a different experience. Does that feel more in line with what you would like? Right. Yeah. That's yeah. I think that's important because price is always is always on the forefront of people's mind, even anything. And so, you know, trying to take that that particular objection away. Totally. And then it's also understanding what they're comparing it to. Yeah. Like, are you comparing it to um, what's that? I know you're not a tax, uh, but like, what's the turbo? Somebody comparing it to turbo tax. Like, okay, well, you know, if you ever filed some turbo tax, there, right. do you want to pay an extra, you know, a few thousand dollars because you didn't have somebody looking at where you could save? So having that kind of conversation with them where do you want a situation where you could accidentally overpay by a few thousand dollars, but it's cheaper? Is that something you want? Because that's not me. Right. And that's fine if you want yeah, that. Like, right. no judgment, no shame. Right. It's just not me. <laughs> Great question. We have time for one more question. If anybody like to ask. I have one, but I don't know how to ask it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, know it's, I don't know how relevant it is compared to a lot of what you've been talking about, but I'm in a very relationship, yeah. referral-driven industry. And 
I've only been here for six months, so everyone I meet is someone I've never met with before, most yeah. likely. And I've been finding that when I go to events or meet people and sit down with them, it's kind of common practice. It seems like they've kind of got an hour. Okay. And of that hour, depending on how the conversation goes, it might take a half half that time just getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. So the you did it early on, like the form that you had yeah. of the med spa person kind of setting a form to their potential client right. referral, whatever it might be, the questions to ask beforehand. How do you feel about that in like a networking one-on-one -on -one setting with someone that may or may not be a good referral partner for you or even someone you do business with in the future, but just from an aspect of time management almost. Like I said, I don't know how to ask this and I'm, I'm sure it's not relevant per se. No, it's relevant. Are you saying that um, you're meeting with potential referral partners or are you meeting with potential clients? Either. So they're both the form of sales and I can even ask questions that put in a form for both. Okay. I just feel like it's not common practice for people. I feel like, you know, you meet someone at an event like this and set up to get coffee a week from now. And then when you go meet coffee with them, you, you guys don't know anything about each other. You just know that they are an accountant, for example. So I would ask them before you make the coffee. Ask, ask them what? Whatever questions you need to know okay. to know that that's worth your time. So not necessarily what's your budget, because that's like an awkward question. For sure. I just, I feel like it's not a typical thing for people to do that. It's, it seems like, at least for me, or maybe how I've been trained in the past, it's just show up, wing it, and see what you can get out of it, as opposed to kind of setting that structure beforehand, if it's talking with the potential referral partner just in general. Does this make sense at all? Of course. Um, it's, it's not really something I've ever seen anyone or heard anyone talk about. Well, personally, I don't think that's a reason not to do it. Yeah. If you're feeling this way, I'm sure everybody feels this way, and it's really irritated. That well, because I'm like, Yeah, I feel like I sit and spend a half hour someone gets to know me, I get to know them, and then we're rushing at the end to talk about what we do, hey, or hey. what we're looking for, how we can help each other, what, how we can move forward together, because we only have had for less than half the time to go through that. And maybe that's my fault for structuring it on a more personal level. I'm trying to figure out if I even like you, one, and <laughs> if I can trust you. Yeah. Because you know, if you're trying, if I'm sitting in a meeting, I, I mean, I'm in lending and banking, so if I can sit with a realtor or a mortgage lender, to talk about how if they have someone that they can't work with, I'd be happy to take a look. But instead, or even an insurance agent, and we're sitting and trying to figure out how we can work together, and they walk in immediately start trying to sell me life insurance, I'm over it. Like, yeah, it'd be nice to know up front of if that's going to be the case, so that we have more time to get out of that. You know what I mean? I or know. just cancel it. Yeah, so you'd be like, what? Are you, what, what kind of place are you in right now? Are you looking for more referral referral Are you looking for more, more clients? Which one is more important to you right now? And if they're like, what's your client? Be like, okay, probably not the best fit, but I have my so and so. Like, and give them a reason. So you just want to know what those questions are. And it's like a casual thing to ask so that you can help them the best way you can. Because they're gonna, not going to want to show up at an appointment. Spend an hour on someone who's like, I don't want to buy it. Right. It's not a good use of time for anything. So I, I would try it. And if you get like a lot of bad feedback, maybe consider, but I would also think if somebody doesn't like that, that's like a red flag. Yeah. Like, I don't think about like, yeah. Yeah. And that's what their goal is. Like, what's your biggest goal from me? Right. Do you want more referrals or do you want more clients or whatever it is? Um, and you want to use like radio check boxes where you can check off an answer or a yes or no or multiple choice or something. If you have like they need to type stuff in, yeah, nobody wants to fill that right. So you want to make it as fast as possible. There's a ton of form uh, options. Then you can just use Google Forms. Thank you. Big round of applause for Alika. Thank you. Definitely take her up on her offer for those email honeypot emails. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be great. AliciaBar.com. Raise your hand if you learned something today. God, that makes me so happy. Would anybody like to share 
one thing they're going to use in their business right away? Yeah. So hopefully these guys will tell you, but I get after them on follow up literally daily. So just <laughs> reaffirming that follow up really is how you can gain customers' trust and teaching us, you know, I just download the templates that I'll send out to everybody too, but just teaching us different ways, like how can we connect to our customers with the follow up? You know, and trying to, you are trying to create a friend and create trust. And, you know, we're working in a very personal space in their home. So, so yeah, follow up. I love. Yeah. So, articles about like how shades and stuff make a difference for somebody's face, great to send. Maybe some images of a house that you just installed stuff in. Looks so beautiful. Can't wait to do the same for you. Have you made a decision yet? Those would be like those templates are like that, just giving you some ideas that are more custom to you that you can think of when you're looking at this. Thank you. That concludes our meeting for today. And I, I just want to encourage everybody to stick around for another 30 minutes of casual networking. Don't forget okay. next month's business after hours meeting on February 28th, Brad Montgomery, embrace your awesomeness. That'll be another great meeting. I'm pressing the button. Okay. Okay. Didn't work. All right. <laughs> um, and, and don't forget to refer a friend to the Cherry Creek Chamber of Commerce. You will get $50 for anybody that actually signs up as a member. Thanks again. We'll see you next month. Thank you. What, what, is, what does that stand for, that acronym? It's not an acronym. It's just like really a bit. Friendly. Just a bit. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. It was like, and I thought it was at the first part of the presentation. I missed it. I do put it in it caps was, so I can yeah. understand it. But okay. I'm just like emphasizing it's like, it's, it's a bit. Like you okay, so I didn't miss anything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, maybe you need yeah. to.